and good evening to you. Today's language at the official COVID inquiry would have made a drunken trucker on a drugged up stag do in Amsterdam go pink with embarrassment. Now, away from the microphone, I have a vocabulary myself, and even I was shocked. If you have children in earshot, it's become a general rule of good parenting in Britain to keep them away from political news. This is not, however, what we should focus on first this evening. After hearing a lot yesterday about the dysfunction and chaos in Johnson's Downing Street, causing Lord Bethel on this programme to say he thought Boris Johnson was the worst possible Prime Minister for a crisis like this, today we got on to the consequences of the dither and the distraction. Let's go back to February 2020, just as it's becoming clear how serious this pandemic is, but weeks before Boris Johnson had declared a lockdown. The leading lawyer in the inquiry asked Johnson's senior advisor, Dominic Cummings, whether, since it was obvious the virus was going to spread around the world, the Prime Minister wasn't told. Cummings says he was, but no one in Whitehall thought the UK would be in the biggest crisis since the war within a month. People were not ringing alarm bells, they were going skiing. What about the vulnerable? At this point, Mr Cummings said there was essentially no shielding plan at all for those most at risk of severe disease. And what in more general terms about the seriousness with which the Prime Minister himself considered the vulnerable? Later in the year, the diary of the chief scientist, Sir Patrick Vallance, recorded him saying that his party think the whole thing is pathetic and Covid is just nature's way of dealing with old people. And I'm not entirely sure I disagree with them. Older Britons apparently should accept their fate and let the young get on with it. Lee Kane, Johnson's Director of Communications, said he was heavily influenced by the views of right-wing newspapers, particularly the Daily Telegraph. So where does this leave the scientists, the people who actually knew stuff? One of the most influential at the time was Professor John Edmonds, the epidemiologist who was on all the relevant committees, and I vividly remember interviewing him about the situation back then. I'm going to be talking to him again in a moment. But before I leave this, I just want to make one point. We are not talking only about recent, if painful, history. There are many in the Conservative Party who even now look forward to Boris Johnson coming back in triumph and human nature being human nature, acting in much the same way again. And you can make up your own minds, but I ask, should what we have heard this week put an end, once and for all, to that kind of talk? And Professor Edmonds is with me now. Professor Edmonds, um, a lot to talk about. But first of all, we heard Dominic Cummings saying today that the UK could have avoided lockdown if a massive test and trace capacity had been in place by March 2020. Now, in a way, it's academic because it wasn't. But what's your view of that? Yeah, I think that's... Well, I think it's academic, so I, I don't think we would have ever got into a position of having such a, a, a scheme in place. We would have also had to have it in place and very effective really at the beginning, not by March. We had had to have that in place by early February, because if you uh, if you remember, we actually imported a lot of cases from Italy and France and so on throughout February, people going skiing and so on. Mm. Uh, so I, I think uh, we would have had to have a really effective um, test and trace um, system in place really at the end of January, beginning of February, later than that, it's not going to work. Yeah. John, I don't know if you remember, but I could remember asking you at one point, what was your biggest regret about the whole episode? And you said not locking down earlier. It would have been very, very hard, but we should have done it, and that would have saved many lives. I think what we've learned from the inquiry today explains why that was impossible, the complete confusion about the seriousness of the of the pandemic, even at the early stages. Um, As somebody who is, as it were, slightly on the outside, what are your reflections on the role of scientists in all of this? Because it does seem that the views of newspapers, the views of Tory backbenchers were playing more heavily inside Number 10, right at the heart of the machine, than you and Sir Patrick Vallance and Chris Whitty and all the rest of it. Yeah, it's a it's a shame. I mean, I understand that uh, that politicians have to weigh not just the scientific evidence; they have to weigh other evidence, uh, you know, social evidence, operational concerns, um, economic evidence, and they need to weigh all those things together. It's very hard. I'm not trying to pretend that it was mm. easy. It was very hard. Uh, and of course, the politicians will also weigh political evidence. Um, what their backbenchers might think of something what the Daily Mail might think of something. Now, as a scientist, because we don't care about those sorts of things at all, and we don't think, I certainly didn't think, 
didn't think at the time and don't think now that those sorts of concerns should be forefront. Um, mm. But I'm not a politician. They do have those sorts of concerns in the forefront. And it's a, I think it did this country a great service, some of the... Um, some of the because actually most people were very were very much in favor of taking quite stringent action and there was a very loud minority at the on, on the right of um you know the, of the right of the political spectrum yeah. that i think dragged the country i think did did the country a disservice at times yes um you know you said in the past i think quite rightly the really important stuff is what lessons can be learned rather than who to point the finger at and in that spirit Given what you have heard over the last couple of days, do you think the system should be better organised for a future pandemic? Is there something systemic wrong inside the heart of government? Well, the system needs to be able to, uh, you know, the system needs to be need, needs to be robust enough that individuals don't make a difference. And I think that's pretty clear that that wasn't the case. So yes, I don't know how to reform the system. That's not my area, of course. But there, but I think we were pretty clearly in a position where a few individuals did, uh, you know, did make a big difference. Um, and of course, there will always be that to some extent. But I, I do think that that, that we, we we suffered as a consequence. In the first uh, six months of uh, the pandemic, I think about forty thousand extra deaths happened in the UK, and, and you said that you think. Uh, had we locked down early, we would have prevented many deaths. How many deaths do you think could have been prevented? Is it possible? Are we talking hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands? What sort of figure are we talking about? If we'd have moved the lockdown forward by a week, uh, we'd, have, we'd have saved thousands of deaths. I'm pretty sure of it. It's very hard to do the counterfactual. Act. Of course, you don't of know course, it. Of course, yeah. People might have changed their behaviour anyway. In fact, they were changing their behaviour. But um, I'm pretty sure many thousands would have survived that first wave if we'd have shifted things forward by about a week. Mm. Um, I remember you working frantically at this period. You were doing all you could and you were trying to warn people about the seriousness of the pandemic. When you heard the comment uh, allegedly made by Boris Johnson in Patrick Valance's diary about COVID being nature's way of dealing with old people, what did you think? Oh. Well, I, I mean, that's very disappointing, isn't it? Uh, you know, people, life is still life. Uh, you know, people have value uh, irrespective of their age.